All right, everybody. We've got a lot to get through today. Very long story. So let's get started. Um, I, I, some of you might, might know I was supposed to give this uh, uh, talk last weekend. Um, I had just come back, ironically, from England, um, from uh, going and being a total geek at a Star Wars convention. Um, and then I brought back the worst souvenir that you possibly could. I brought back COVID, so that was why we were able to swap things out. But thankfully, um, this is kind of a good wrap up of the last couple of weeks that we've spent in the Reformation. And in general, this story is a little bit more self-contained than some of the other ones. So um, I don't think that there's a problem with doing it out of order. So um, just thoughts in general. When the idea of the English Reformation, the Tudor era comes to mind, what do we think about? Henry VIII. Henry VIII. Bunch of wives. Yeah. Bunch of wives. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty. Is the King James version in that time frame? No, that would be King James who comes later on, but those are spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, thinking back to, especially when I gave the talk on the German Reformation before, you know, we talked about Luther and, you know, this really dramatic story and all of his religious convictions and how that brought him up against the Pope and the, the um, uh, princes in Germany and all of that kind of stuff. This story is a little bit different. So if you think of the German Reformation as a religious story with political overtones, this is a political story with religious overtones. And those overtones are very prominent, but what you'll still see here is, you know, like it's all about this really dramatic family life. And it's kind of like, well, why study the Tudors? Like, if you know anything about this story, this is kind of like not really like church material. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is, you know, sex and murder and intrigue and all of these kinds of things. And and um, so why why am I doing this? Why do I think this is important? There are a couple of reasons. And first off, I mean, it is just kind of a good story. Like, we kind of just need that. And if I don't tell you, then the only way that you can probably find out is a raunchy HBO show. So this is going to be good. Um, it is, but it's, it's, it's like a Shakespearean drama. It's like Game of Thrones, if you're, if you're um, aware of that show. Um, I also think it's just important because history is very complex, and especially when we talk about this in a church context, I think that people have a tendency to kind of whitewash all of the complexity. We like to have good people and bad people, and, like, and things like Luther's story, especially for Protestants like us, it's really easy to be like, I'm on this guy's side and I'm against this guy. And in this one, it's kind of a mess. And like, I, I think that like, it's a really good story, but we have to recognize that history is complex, people, is complex, people are complex. So when it comes to, you know, why is Henry VIII suddenly you, you know, pursuing all of these different women? What's going on? Is this just him just being a raunchy old man? And it's like, well, yeah, but he also had some really um, you know, um, pure and, and you know, sincerely held religious convictions. So we have to recognize that. And ultimately, I just kind of look at this as kind of like, like think about this story in Genesis and think about the family of Abraham and how when you read that story and you're just like, man, these people, they make mistakes and they do it over and over again. And yet, I don't think that we have a problem with seeing that in our Bible because we're kind of like, well, we see that God works through it. I would encourage you to kind of look at this story the same way and to, to kind of see like, we can have this really, these really complex people who do things that we might not even understand, but ultimately we do see God's working through this. So let's get started. And um, the first thing that, um, you know, we could spend a whole, you know, lecture just on this, but once upon a time, there was a war called the War of the Roses. And you don't have to know too much, except that this was a civil war basically fought over dynastic power and the people who come out on top are the Tudors. This is the start of the Tudor era that we talk about. And we will go through that whole Tudor era today. Um, so the winner of this war was Henry VII of England. And who has oh, yeah. Henry VII? Yeah. So here, as, as I do this, you guys can pass that around as kind of a representation of, of the craziness of this time period. This is our, our Game of Thrones. <laughs> Um, so, so Henry VII comes to the throne. Um, you, have, you have to think about this. Like coming to the throne after a civil war, that's a pretty tenuous 
you're, you're, you're holding the throne, but it's a pretty tenuous hold on it. And so the biggest thing that you want is to establish that you are the proper rulers and that you should be the proper rulers forever and ever. And so he and his wife have four children. They have Arthur, they have Henry, they have Margaret, and they have Mary. And all four of them are going to play different roles in this story, um, even though we typically only really think about Henry as kind of this, this important figure. So um, the first thing that really happens is that their eldest son, who is the heir presumptive, he gets married. He marries a woman named Catherine of Aragon. And things are going well. Feels like we're setting up a story for a real dynasty to be established. He dies, <laughs> like five months later, and um, Catherine says that this marriage was never consummated, which actually isn't surprising, especially given that they were still both fairly young, and that's important for later on. But he dies, that throws the man that we come to know as Henry VIII into a totally different life for himself than he probably thought he'd have. So you better give that crown up because you're dead five months after marriage. <laughs> oh, Mary. Um, so you, Henry VIII? Wait, do, do, you have, do you have the, the thing? Yes. Okay, so Henry comes to the throne. What happens next? Henry and Catherine, they get married. This was established as a way to, you know, try to, you know, keep everything, you know, in the family and again, fulfill this dynastic expectation. And so they're married in 1509 and they have a daughter. And they were also- You said they were young. What are the ages? I mean, we're, we're talking like about 14, 15, 16, 17, yeah. 18, yeah. Um, so, at, you know, at this time, um, you know, if you have thoughts in your mind that like everybody got married young, just way back when, it's not true. Dynastic marriages often took place. Even those typically were not consummated because people weren't stupid back then. They knew that early sex led to early pregnancies and early pregnancies didn't lead to more babies, they led to more death. So uh, in general, like it's, it, it, Catherine was probably being very truthful here. Um, but they, but uh, Catherine, Henry, Mary, they have a daughter named Mary. Pretty good. He wants a son, but you know, we'll take what we can get right now. Um, but in the next nine years of their marriage, there are no other children that come from this union. And Henry starts to believe that his marriage is cursed. <laughs> now, this is kind of a strange thing, but let's, t let's talk about why he would have believed that. So Henry was a devout Catholic. And um, if you think to like the context of Luther and everything that's going on on the continent at this time, um, he was firmly against the German Reformation. He wrote a tract. Um, basically defending the Catholic understanding of the sacraments, and the Pope gave him the title Defender of the Faith. Um, in 1539, he affirmed what we call the Six Articles, and this is the affirmation of six different points of Catholic, do Catholic doctrine, including transubstantiation, the idea that um, the, the bread and wine in the Eucharist actually, like the essence of those things, actually become the body and blood of Christ, as opposed to um, being a memorial or opposed to just the idea of like a spiritual presence within that uh, host. And uh, clerical celibacy, which again, remember Martin Luther had kind of railed against and Luther got married as well. Um, and then it also established that England would not join the Lutheran princes. At the very end of my last lecture, we talked about the Schmalkaldic League, and that was all of these German princes getting together and kind of forming this political military alliance. And there was some thought that England would join them, and ultimately this is where they kind of, Henry says no. But, so then his, his marriage to Catherine. She was, as I said, originally married to Arthur Tudor, um, Henry's brother. She gave birth to Mary. She had several male children who did not survive. And Henry believed that their marriage was cursed, and he rooted it in the fact that in Leviticus, there's this this verse that says, and if a man shall take his brother's wife, it is an unclean thing. He hath uncovered his brother's nakedness. They shall be childless. That's horrifying. That's horrifying for this man who is absolutely, like he thinks it's absolutely necessary to have a male heir. At this time, England had never had a female ruler. And that's gonna change pretty quickly, but this, that was just absolutely unheard of at the time. So when they're 10 years into this marriage and she hasn't given him a male heir, he doesn't really know what else to do. And so this is where I kind of say like, you kind of have to hold all of that together. Like 
was he, you know, a lecherous man even in his younger years? Yeah, yeah, he was, he was definitely making eyes at other women in the court. But at the same time, like, he truly did believe that God was withholding his blessing from this union. So what, what's to do? Like, let's start to think about, like, where can this story go? Um, but, you know, like I said, there was also, um, you know, this other wrinkle in the story, which is that Anne Boleyn is uh, also in court. So Anne Boleyn's sister, Mary, was one of Catherine's ladies-in-waiting. So uh, Mary was around, Anne was around. Henry starts to think that she looks pretty nice. Um, she was a very educated and intelligent woman. She was uh, Protestant and brought up in kind of this humanistic education um, that was becoming really popular even for uh, women at this time period, at least for, for uh, noble women. Um, she was stubborn and opinionated, and Henry just thought, like, she was the greatest. Mm -hmm. And so he's got her as, like, this is his prize. This is what he wants. So the situation came to be called the king's great matter. How do we get a, a, a divorce is impossible. So how do we get an annulment from the pope? And so uh, Henry is assisted by Thomas Cranmer, this guy, and Thomas Cromwell, this guy, in trying to get this annulment. They were able to do so, it took a while for it to happen, but they were able to, to do so. And in 1532, Henry and Anne are married. Um, these two people mm -hmm. also become very important because they do legitimately help to codify a lot of the Protestant thought that's starting to come into England at this time. And so they have, a significance that goes just beyond helping the king get a new marriage. Um, so in this story, think of Henry VIII as somebody who like, he is a devout Catholic in terms of like his, his beliefs, like what he believes. He's, you know, I mean, <laughs> well, we, we have to kind of hold that intention with what we see him doing, but these are the beliefs that he's kind of staked not only like his life, but his identity on. Uh, but he was a practical Protestant when it suited him. And that's kind of the whole point that that this was all done to uh, benefit himself. Um, religious services under Henry basically continued in the Catholic manner, but they broke from the church in Rome and broke from the Pope. So let's get back to our family tree. So we've got Henry's got the crown. We've got um, he's he's had one wife, one daughter. So Catherine is divorced. He marries Anne Boleyn. They have a daughter named Elizabeth. But um, this kind of starts to create a problem. What do you do when you have a new Protestant wife? You would like her children to be legitimate, but you've also got this previous marriage. Well, you divorced the wife, you got an annulment, you also have to declare the daughter illegitimate. So this sets off a cycle of, of these children of, of Henry kind of being um, it, it, they, they all carried the moniker of bastard throughout their entire life, and it was a real source of, of uh, hurt and contention for them. So, um, during his reign, he declares Mary illegitimate. In uh, 1534, he's declared the head of the Church of England, and he's excommunicated by the Pope. Um, 1534, again, you know, this is going to be a cycle. He's already kind of getting bored of Anne. This woman who he thought was so just amazing, this stubborn, opinionated woman, doesn't make for a good and <clears throat> modest and quiet wife. And um, I also just wanted to point out that in 1535, there are a number of Catholics who are executed for voicing dissent to Henry's new religious policies, including a man named Thomas More, or, or yeah, uh, yeah, Thomas More. All of these guys are named Thomas. Um, he was a Catholic lawyer and a humanist, very much against the Reformation, so when he sees Henry doing this, even though Henry's doing it for mostly practical purposes, he's very much against that decision to break from Rome. He refused to acknowledge Henry as the supreme head of the church, and so he gets accused of treason, he's tried, and he gets his head chopped off, uh, the first of many. Um, he went to the chopping block and said, I die the king's good servant and God's first. So I, I bring that up because we have this tendency, and we're going to get to it, to think about, like, Mary is Bloody Mary. But this is just kind of the culture. And so uh, in this world where treason is the, the highest, um, uh, you know, the, the, the highest um, issue, not only for the royals, but in terms of, like, the, the, the punishment that comes with it, like, there are a lot of people 
in this religious debacle who get wrapped up. And it's not just under Bloody Mary. It's under Henry, it's under Elizabeth too. So we can still call her that, but kind of remember that history is written by the victors. And so it's the Protestants who have said, oh, this woman, she killed all of these, these, Pro these Protestants. And yeah, she did, but she wasn't alone. Um, so Henry's reign, um, kind of the end of it, uh, or, or continuing on, in um, 1536, Anne miscarries her third male child. And so, you know, this is, maybe it's Henry. He didn't know, but maybe it's him. Um, which can, but uh, that convinces Henry that she also is not gonna be able to give him the heir that he needs. So another annulment seems pretty unlikely. So this is where things really start to get sticky. Henry and Thomas Cromwell, one of the men who actually helped to get the annulment in the first place, start to explore other options. And at that time, it's kind of, I mean, what do you do when you start to see like, oh, I can accuse people of treason and I can chop their heads off. That's pretty cool. That's pretty effective, right? And so Anne comes under all of these charges for conspiracy, adultery, incest with her brother, witchcraft, and all of this stuff people basically agree was all trumped up charges that had no basis in anything. But her family was kind of falling from influence in the courts, and so when this happened, like there wasn't really anybody who said anything about it, and she went to the chopping block. And so we got divorced and beheaded, and then 13 days later, Henry becomes engaged to Jane Seymour. Um, or sorry, 10 days later they get, they get married, but he's, he's pretty quick on all of these things. Um, 1536, the second act of supremacy declares Elizabeth illegitimate. You can see where we're going here. Thankfully, in his mind, he and Jane finally have the son that he wants. So we've got Edward. He's gonna be the legitimate heir, right? Looks good. But then Jane dies. Um, after the difficult birth. Three years later, Henry gets married to um, Anna Cleves. That just kind of goes nowhere. He regrets the match almost immediately. He, he's at the point now where he's the head of the church. He can do whatever he wants. So he just divorces her. Um, and uh, so then we get, uh, he marries Catherine Howard in July of the same year. She was 17 and he was 49. Um, and this was, again, another sticky political situation. She was the Duke of, of uh, Norfolk's niece, and this worried Cromwell because Norfolk was a political opponent. And it, there's all, of, again, all of this, this tension between religion and, and politics and all of these things, like the slightest change in power in court can truly mean a death sentence for people. Um, several reformers who were protégés of Cromwell were burned as heretics. Uh, Cromwell fell out of power, though it's not really sure why. He was beheaded the same day that Catherine got married to Catherine, that Henry got married to Catherine. Um, so then we've got the, uh, oh yeah. So the problem there though, is that this also wasn't a terribly great match. Um, Catherine was very young, very flirtatious and came under suspicion of having an affair and she did, yeah, she did. Um, and so that kind of actually was seen as a legitimate charge of treason, and she was beheaded. And then a year and a half later, Henry finally married his sixth wife, Catherine Parr. So if you know the, uh, the saying, you know, it's the, the, the six wives, we keep them in, in mind by saying it's divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded, survived. She will survive her husband. And uh, that's, I guess, a pretty big victory in this time. Um, during this time, Catherine also helps Henry reconcile with Mary and Elizabeth, and so in 1543, the third act of su succession puts them back in the line of succession after Edward. So male primogeniture still is going to say that Edward is the rightful heir first, but then his sisters are re-legitimized as claimants to the throne after him. But um, then in 1547, Henry dies! And he's... <laughs> um, so then his son, who's still, I think, uh, yeah, nine years old, he comes to the throne. So um, Zach has come to the throne, and uh, he's basically going to rule with a council of about 16 men, including his uncle. Um, let's see, if, where, where do I have this? Um, 
Yeah, so, so one, he's, he's ruling on behalf, uh, or w w with the help of um, men, including um, a couple of Jane Seymour's brothers. And so obviously at nine years old, he needs a lot of help, but he is still <laughs> supposedly the power behind the throne. Um, so going forward, yeah, just I wanted to, to, you know, kind of take a look at this now. This is the line of succession. So we've got Edward, we've got Mary, we've got Elizabeth. It, what happens after them? If, if none of those lines bear heirs, what would have happened? Well, in the line of succession, it would have gone to Mary Tudor, Henry's youngest sister who had already passed away. Um, her line included the Grey family, including um, Lady Jane Grey, and Jane was basically fourth in line to the throne. That will be important later on. Um, there was also this whole um, line from Margaret Tudor. I'm not really sure why, but for whatever reason, they were, they were cut from this whole line of succession. <laughs> but they will be important later, too. <laughs> um, so, yeah, w what do we have here? We've got Edward on the throne. He is the first English monarch who is raised as a Protestant, and he, his reign is going to be very tumultuous. Again, you know, these political social unrests and rebellions are still going to plague him all the way through. Um, but the Church of England, of England is going to become recognizably Protestant. Um, they, they abolish clerical celibacy, they abolish the mass, they have services in English, and then the Book of Common Prayer is um, something that was kind of the brainchild of Thomas Cramner. Um, this basically is the liturgy of the Church of England. We still use it today for wedding services and things like that. Um, it is still in active use today. Um, it contains prayers, liturgy, services, daily scripture readings. It was in English, not in Latin. Um, and then represented a major theological shift towards Protestantism. So justification by faith, um, which obviously is going to be coming from the Lutheran side, especially predestination, which would be coming from the Calvinist side. And then um, emphasizing that the mass is a service of thanksgiving, not sacrifice. So remember what I talked about a couple of weeks ago about the the importance of like the, the whole Reformation can be boiled down to the priest, then pastor, going from having the Eucharist and offering it upwards towards the altar, towards God, versus towards the people. A sacrifice, a gift. And so th that was really important in English theology as well. So no elevation of the host, no raising up as if you're sacrificing it to God. So some of our liturgy now in our communion is from this, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. And from Luther's as well. Yeah. Um, but obviously the line of succession is always going to be the big problem here. And so what do we do? We've got Edward, but then we still have this female-dominated future. I mean, we're, we're at a point where it's like, unless Edward can have a male heir, we're going to have female leadership <coughs> in the future of this, this um, dynasty. And Edward was sickly. He was still young. It kind of wasn't expected that he was ever going to be able to ha you know, give a male heir. So what do we do? Do we go with Mary I, who has the claim of being Henry's you know, next legitimized heir and oldest daughter? Well, she's a Catholic, so that's a problem. Do we go with Elizabeth, the second heir, or you know, the second born daughter? Like, I mean, if you do that, how do you subvert Mary and just jump to Elizabeth? Or do you go with the cousin, Lady Jane, who doesn't really have the best claim to the throne, but also was a really committed Protestant and who would do the best job of continuing Edward's reforms? These are the big questions. So let's add some new characters to the story. Jane is sent to live in the household of Thomas Seymour, who, Catherine, so after Henry dies, Catherine gets married to Thomas Seymour, who is Jane Seymour's brother. So we're keeping it all in the family. Um, and Thomas's brother, Edward, was the protector of the realm. So he's a very powerful figure in Edward's um, whole administration. But the problem is, is that Catherine dies shortly after childbirth and Thomas kind of goes nuts and he's imprisoned on suspicion of conspiring to depose his own brother as protector and he is executed in 1549. In October of that same year, Edward kind of starts to go nuts and he knows that he's falling out of favor with the gentry so he essentially cap he kidnaps the king and takes him away to this castle and I, nobody really knows what he was thinking. 
Um, but obviously he was arrested for that, and that kind of creates a power vacuum in Edward's administration. The person who rises up to take that power is a man named John Dudley, who was the Earl of Warwick, and he emerges as kind of the leader of this privy council surrounding Edward, and Edward Seymour was beheaded as well. Um, that, that charge was a little bit exaggerated, but nevertheless, he, <laughs> he had to go. Um, in May of 1553, uh, uh, Jane Grey, who's again still very young, marries Guilford Dudley, the son of the man who took over from the Seymours. Um, in June, Edward finally decides to make a decision about the issue of succession, and he declares that Jane and her male heirs are going to be the, like that's, that's the direction that the crown's gonna go. Um, so what does he do? He declares his sister's illegitimate again, and a month later, he dies. So, Edward, who's Jane? Um, so, Edward dies, Jane, Jane is proclaimed queen on the uh, 10th of July, 1553. Jane has the distinction of having the shortest reign of any English monarch. How long did she hold the throne? Anybody know? Nine days. Oh. <laughs> so don't get used to that throne. <laughs> don't get used to that crown. Um, she was 15 when she was placed on the throne. She's basically a puppet of this coup that's going on. She does not want this throne. She knows this is a very dangerous place for her to be. Um, she is a fascinating figure. She is a committed humanist and Protestant, and she corresponded with um, um, the Zurich reformer Heinrich Bullinger. Um, exceptional young woman with exceptional thoughts even on like reform and Christianity and um, I've got a couple of clips that I can show I don't know what uh, what time are we at right now um, we're, uh, we got about a half hour. okay good because like um, I've got a couple of clips and mainly what I want is to just kind of show you know these these clips that come from some of these shows and movies none of which I can really recommend to you <laughs> unless you're watching it without the kids um, but there are some really beautiful moments where this matter of religion is still portrayed in a way that I think is really true to the characters. And so this one is just a tiny little snippet of Jane Grey talking to Thomas Seymour, who she, you know, she was sent to live in his household. And um, by all accounts, it does seem like they had a bit of kind of like a father-daughter connection. Don't mind, Catherine. Or me, for that matter. Sometimes things that seem uh, insurmountable that often resolve quickly. And none of these states that we find ourselves in last forever. Neither pleasure or pain. And your Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Can you take comfort in that? She's really remarkable, and you should look her up. And uh, her story is just terribly um, short but um, it's amazing to think of what she would have been like if she had been, you know, I'm kind of giving the story away here, um, but uh, um, if she had been able to continue her thoughts. Um, she would have continued Edward's reform, like there's no doubt about that, but these politics, um, you know, these political situations change pretty rapidly and pretty quickly the crown shifts from Jane to Mary because her supporters back the count or the, the council starts backing Mary's supporters and so we get this shift and Jane's reign is basically just recognized as a coup. She didn't say. Yes, and, and please, yes. <laughs> you can swap the, the crown and give it to Mary. What what happened to Jane? Uh, we're gonna get there. <laughs> so she wasn't beheaded at this Not point. Yet. Okay. Not yet. Don't give it away <laughs> Not that it's a surprise <laughs> to anyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good educated guess. Uh, Jane's primary supporter, who was her father-in-law, um, was accused of treason and executed less than a month later. Jane was held as a prisoner in the Tower of London and convicted of high treason in 1553. So, yes, this carries a death, um, you know, a, a sentence of death. But Mary recognized that her cousin legitimately was just a puppet in this whole regime, and so she tries to spare her, spare both her life and Guildford's. Um, so that, that will hold for quite some time. Um, 
Mary, after she's come to the throne, she's again got to deal with this issue of succession. She delegitimizes her sister again. Poor and Elizabeth. yeah, poor Elizabeth. Um, and so then she sets out right away to figure out how does she establish her own line of succession. Well, Mary's cousin, who is the head of the House of Habsburg, who is really like, I mean, basically these are the people who are controlling everything that's going on in continental Europe at this time. Um, uh, remember, Char uh, Charles V was the Holy Roman Empire during Luther's time. He's still around. He suggests that Mary marry his son, Philip of Spain. And so um, this made sense to her. Her mother wasn't really foreign, but Catherine of Aragon, you know, obviously she wasn't the queen of, she wasn't, you know, a, uh, a noble in England. So this kind of made sense to Mary because as a, she's the first female ruler. What do you do in a society that emphasizes male primogeniture when it's like, I have to get married, I have to produce a male heir, but who do you marry? Do you marry a subject who's lower than you? Do you, does that person then become elevated? Does that person become the king? Or do you marry a foreign prince? In which case you've just placed England under foreign rule. <laughs> and so these are all questions that, that dog Mary, dog your sister, and, and like, I mean, there's a reason why today they've done away with all of this. Um, in, in today's royal family, um, we, we're not gonna have this issue, but there is no more uh, male primogeniture. So whether you're a, a boy or a girl, the first in line inherits the throne. Um, Mary's advisors tried to convince her to marry an Englishman. This, this idea of marrying Philip of Spain was not popular with the people. Um, because again, they just really didn't know what would happen if we brought, brought um, England under a foreign ruler. And of course, in this time, the, this, you know, the Protestants really don't like this because um, Philip of Spain was a Catholic. So that would cement Catholicism again as we're going back and forth here. Um, but ultimately, um, let's see. Um, oh, just a second. I can't see my notes at the end of this. Um, ultimately, the issue that occurred is that because there's all of this political and religious dissent, there are a lot of more, a lot more coups, rebellions that crop up. So then there was a man who, his goal was to depose Mary, and a lot of the nobles got in on it, including, um, you know, um, John Dudley's family, and and um, so he was eventually executed. Um, and he and a couple of other family members were eventually executed as well, um, and Henry Gray especially. But um, this really convinced Mary that, unfortunately, her cousin, who she's tried to, to protect for a while, is still a threat to her throne, and she's never not going to be. And so, unfortunately, what, I mean, Mary really did not want to do this, but she does condemn Jane to um, the chopping block. Um, Again, Jane was just very, very incredible young woman. Um, she comes to the, the scaffold and as the story goes, she says, good people, I am come hither to die and by law I am condemned to the same. The fact indeed against the Queen's Highness was unlawful, but I do wash my hands thereof in innocency before God and in the face of you good Christian people this day. So she recognizes that her claim to the throne was illegitimate. Does she say that because she's been ousted, or does she say that because she legitimately believes it? Who's to say? But, you know, she comes to the scaffold, and as she prepares to be parted of her head, she says, Lord, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Um, just really terrible to think about that this is something that, <laughs> that these people were having to deal with at this time. Um, this also proves to be a problem for Elizabeth, because she's also a threat to Mary's throne. And um, the next clip that I'm going to show you comes from um, a movie that I love. Again, it earns its R rating, but it's um, Kate Blanchett as, as Elizabeth I. And um, this is her in her younger years um, under interrogation by Mary's bishops and, and uh, her council, them trying to get her to confess that she's basically a heretic. I cannot confess to something I did not do. These loyals are all in vain. I'm so very mad at you, are party to it. It is plain enough. That is the truth. It 
was to your advantage. You must let me see the Queen. I you can surprise the Queen and the Catholic faith. There's a lot of recognition even today that Protestants and Catholics are very different. But I mean, to place yourself back in this context where this is life and death, this is heresy versus true belief. Like this is, it's just incredible to think of the fact that like these people are all professing belief in what we would see as the same God. They use, you know, basically the same Bible. They they profess the same, um, the same beliefs. They you know profess the the early creeds, but this still, um, you know, forms so much of the, the identity of people at this time, and um, we still carry that with us today. Um, accepting, you know, as I've been mentioning, accepting Jane, um, Mary was England's first female ruler. This is a problem. What do you do? She ends up marrying Philip. Um, and in 1540, uh, 1554, Mary begins to show signs of being pregnant. This is really good news to her. Like, this is everything that she wants, right? It's really strange, but she had several false pregnancies. And so she basically, like, all the signs were there that she was pregnant. And then there's no baby. And this is absolutely devastating for her. Um, this family is just not really that good at producing kids. Um, so, let's see. Um, yeah, so, you know, we talk about Bloody Mary. Originally, Mary came to the throne and, and said that she would not compel her people to believe a certain way, but she's going to try to undo all of the Protestant changes, so, like, you know, maybe she's not originally starting out saying you have to believe as I do, but, you know, that's where it's going. Um, she reestablishes the six articles of Henry VIII, reaffirming cl clerical celibacy and transubstantiation, those kinds of things. Um, she bans the Book of Common Prayer and returns England to Roman jurisdiction. She also um, reenacts medieval heresy laws, which then is a problem for the Protestants, regardless of what she says. And in 1555, the first Protestant executions take place. If you've ever read John Fox's Book of Martyrs, that's where a lot of these stories come down from. Again, because we have that book, it's, you know, I mean, these are, these are true stories, and these are, are, are terrible and awful, but do remember that it is still Protestant propaganda. Like, what, the fact that we have this, and the fact that like it portrays like every Protestant as like this perfect martyr against this evil, evil queen, it's just more complicated than that. But all of these stories are still just really, really fascinating and worth your, your worth a read. Um, one of the people who came to be executed was Thomas Cranmer, who was, if you remember, the man, one of the men who first helped Henry VIII to secure the annulment of, uh, of with Catherine of Aragon. Um, he's condemned to death. He's offered the chance to recant his beliefs, and he takes it. And then when he does that, he falls into Mary's trap, and she still refuses to give him a reprieve, or to reprieve him. So then he comes to the shopping block, or, or no, she, she burns him. England, you could, you could be beheaded if you were a noble, and you, like, you, like that was like a, an honorable death, and everybody else was burned. So she gave him a dishonorable death. Uh, but before that happens, he recants his recantation, and um, that's really 
you know, dramatic story as well. He basically takes the right hand that signed his original recantation, puts it in the flame first um, to show that that he regrets that so much. Um, so yeah, this is a depiction at the time of that. You can see his hand sticking out like that. Um, Executed Protestants obviously lauded as martyrs, but the executions were very unpopular, um, even within the Catholic population. Uh, Philip's advisors, so Mary's own husband, his advisors condemned them, uh, but several hundred people were executed in five years. That is pretty dramatic, it's pretty significant. When I talk about the, the, the uh, executions that happened under Henry VIII, under Elizabeth, those, like Henry, there weren't as many executions, there were a lot of executions under Elizabeth, but she also ruled for much longer. And so just like, like this was a supremely dramatic um, time period and obviously very terrifying. Led to a lot of anti-Catholic and Spanish sentiment, obviously. But um, Mary's rule ends pretty quickly as well. After five years, she uh, dies and she's interred in Westminster Abbey. And so then the crown passes to Elizabeth. Um, so, yeah, I, yes, yes, very good. Um, so this is kind of what we've all been leading up to. This young woman, um, she has her, she's 25 when she comes to the throne. She has led an entire life seeing basically everybody she knows, everybody she loves be either um, declared a bastard or, or um, killed. Her mother died when she was only two. I mean, this is, she carries a lot of trauma. Um, but she comes to the throne and the first thing that she's told when she's told that she's queen is this is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Um, she was a Protestant with some Catholic sensibilities and that's kind of reflective of the way that she would also choose to create a culture in England at this time. At this time, obviously, England is still very bitterly divided by uh, Protestantism and Catholicism, but she establishes the English Protestant Church. She becomes the supreme governor over it, not the supreme head like Henry, because misogyny. Um, but this would evolve into the Church of England. Um, her entire reign, like the way that she deals with this problem is called the Elizabethan Settlement. Um, the idea is that she's found a via media or a middle way, and it was intended to end religious turmoil and cultivate a more moderate religious uh, culture with the intention of at least coexistence, if not toleration. Um, she restores the Book of Common Prayer. This was edited just a bit to appeal more to both Catholics and Lutherans, and, but also displays more of a reformed identity. So a lot of different strands coming to play here. Um, let's see, what time is it right now? About 10, 10. Okay, I've got a, a, a scene here that's a little bit long. I'll probably skip it because it's, it's um, or may, maybe we'll play just the first part of it. Um, but it's Elizabeth and her first parliament. And it kind of, it, it's a good way to see the anxieties that Elizabeth was having in terms of like having to speak out against all of these male counselors. Like she's this one lone voice Like she has her vision, but it was hard for her to um, obviously come to this world and actually exert this power, so.
Serve two masters and be three medal to go. Um, that is very reflective of the way that she, of her personality and the way that she kind of ran her, her uh, meetings. Um, that clip goes on, all of her, at that time, Catholic um, council members start to basically pressure her to get married. And she says, basically, who do I marry? And she points out that many men, men in that room had also been divorced and remarried and, you know, kind of calling into question this sanctity of marriage and what she's supposed to do about it. Um, it is a good movie, you just don't watch it with the kids. <laughs> um, issue of succession is still a big issue. Um, she never had a desire to marry and who could blame her. Um, in her mind, marriage is followed by death and it's pretty violent death. And so there were um, times when she said things like, if I, if I follow the inclination of my nature, this is it. Beggar woman and single far rather than queen and married. Um, she did entertain a lot of foreign and domestic marriage offers, but she never accepted any to the consternation of her council. Um, but there was a man in her life that she was madly in love with, and that was Robert Dudley. If you remember, um, I don't think I have the, the um, um, family tree up there, but remember um, the Dudleys, D John Dudley was the man who took over from Edward's um, privy councils, council members after they were beheaded. Um, his one younger son was married to Jane Grey, who died during that debacle. His other son was Robert Dudley, and he and Elizabeth were childhood friends. They were basically raised together. They were basically imprisoned in the Tower of London at the same time, um, and he was the stalwart love of her life, her, her entire life. It, you know, nothing could ever happen between them. Unfortunately, Robert had been married when he was pretty young, and it's just really, really dramatic. Like, again, this is like Game of Thrones. Like, it's just like, I, I can't believe that this is a real story. But there was just this kind of thought that, like, maybe they could get married after his wife dies. It's kind of morbid, but um, Robert's wife was sick and she was going to be dying. Today, we think that she probably had cancer of some kind, but they, obviously they were waiting. And then his wife falls down the stairs and dies. And everybody thought it was murder, and everybody thought Elizabeth did it. <laughs> and so she didn't. It's, very, it's much more likely that it was just an accident. But obviously that happens. And then, then the marriage, any potential marriage between them is totally off. Like, it just cannot happen because there's so much scandal surrounding it. But um, they, were, they were lifelong friends up to his death. When she died, they found a letter by her bedside that said his last letter. And it was Robert Dudley's last words to her. Um, but in general, we get this image of the Virgin Queen. She does not want to get married to anybody else, especially if it's not Robert. And so in all of these um, conversations, she eventually just says, I am already bound to unto a husband, which is the kingdom of England. Every one of you and as many as English are, as are Englishmen are children and kinsmen to me. Um, and then in regards to the question of an heir, Elizabeth was certain that God would so direct mine and your counsels that ye shall not need to doubt of a successor, um, no more, um, who would be more beneficial to the commonwealth than he who may be born of me. So she was just kind of leaving it in God's hands and it does seem like that was really an act of faith on her part. Um, kind of trying to get through the rest of her 44 year reign, but the big, there's, there's a moment where again, all of these, you know, political debacles, these coups happening. There's a really important thing that happens with Mary, Queen of Scots. Remember, Mary is um, part of this line that was originally ignored in the succession, but she's down here. She's the granddaughter of Margaret Tudor, one of Henry's other sisters, and she was the ruler of Scotland. She was believed by Catholics to be the rightful, rightful ruler of England. Um, it, during this time, other uprisings are happening. As I mentioned, there are executions um, of Catholics under Elizabeth. Uh, Pope Pius excommunicates Elizabeth and commands Catholics to refuse to obey her. This encourages more uprisings. Mary herself was involved in several coups and she was accused of treason and beheaded. So you get to keep your crown. So it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> um, Elizabeth 
kind of like Mary agonizing over Jane Grey, Elizabeth agonized over this decision to sign um, Mary's death warrant. And even afterwards, like, lamented that she actually, like, there, there's kind of a story that, like, she says she didn't even mean to sign the death warrant. She, she kind of has the story that, like, other people forged her signature. Is that the truth? Nobody really knows. Um, but going forward then, <laughs> you've got you've got Mary Queen of Scots on one hand and the Catholics internally supporting her. Then you have the external threats coming from Elizabeth's former brother-in-law, <laughs> Philip of Spain, who Philip plans to invade England with 130 ships and overthrow Elizabeth. He you know, builds this huge armada that has become so famous and they start to sail up to the English Channel. As they get around the coast, the English engage with what are called fire ships, which are basically what they sound like, ships that are filled with combustibles that they're sent out into the fleet. And that was really pretty um, effective. Um, that It's crippled by that English response. And then as they kind of limp around the coast of England trying to get back to Spain, there's divinely inspired weather. Like It's just generally acknowledged that God just sent these huge storms to destroy the the uh, Spanish Armada, including a Protestant wind. <laughs> I like that. Um, at that time, though, uh, Elizabeth wasn't, Elizabeth was expecting an invasion. An invasion didn't happen, but she was expecting one, and so she gives this incredible speech um, at Tilbury. Actually, uh, Robert Dudley is leading this, this group of, 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 of troops, and he invites her to come and, and see them. And she comes and has this incredible speech um, she says, let tyrants fear, I have so behaved myself that under God I have placed my chiefest strength and safeguard in the loyal hearts and goodwill of my subjects. And therefore I am come amongst you as you see at this time, not for my recreation and disport, but being resolved in the midst and heat of battle to live and die amongst you, all, amongst you all, to lay down for my God and for my kingdoms and my people, my honor and my blood, even in the dust. I know I have the body of a weak and feeble woman, but I have the heart and stomach of a king. I love her. Um, eventually, though, she does pass away after 44 years on the throne. You can imagine how incredible that is, though, when you think about the stability that she brought after all of that stuff that, that we talked about early on. She died without having named an heir, though. So where do we do? Well, what's actually really funny is that the winner is the line that never was considered in the first place. Mm -hmm. So after all of this, after every person on this this um, family tree is gone. There's one winner, and, and he's no longer a Tudor. So this is the end of the Tudor de dynasty coming down from, from Margaret Tudor. This is now the beginning of the Stuart line. So Henry Stuart and Mary, Queen of Scots, the woman that Elizabeth killed, <laughs> their son becomes the joint ruler of Scotland. So he's James the Seventh of, or yeah, you know, what is it, James the Seventh of Scotland? Yeah, the yeah, Seventh of Scotland, but James the First of Scotland in England. Um, so you can give your uh, crown. Who's James the first? <laughs> he took that because he knew he would win. He took that very hard. Um, where do we leave the end of the story? Um, after Elizabeth passed away, she was interred in Westminster Abbey, and um, for whatever reason, James the first, who you know. He, he, James is kind of a fascinating figure too, kind of for, for the end of the story. He was the son of Catholics, but raised as a Protestant. And when it comes to burying Elizabeth, he inters her and Mary in the same tomb. Is that something either sister would have wanted? Mm, probably not. But I do think that it's kind of a beautiful picture of all, after all of this discord and all of this, this tension, that they are buried together. And then the inscription on their tomb is, partners both in throne and grave, here rest we two sisters, Elizabeth and Mary, in the hope of the resurrection. So these rivals in life now await the return of their shared savior. Um, I was able to go, and when I was in England, I was able to go and see their grave, and it's just kind of a beautiful thing. Um, so as we wrap up all of these weeks on the Reformation, the final image that I want to leave you with is that in the 1970s, they added a little plaque in front of uh, this tomb, it, like literally like where I'm standing in this picture, um, that says, near the tomb of Mary and Elizabeth, remember before God all those who divided by, at the, it, who, all those who divided at the Reformation by different convictions laid down their lives for Christ and conscience sake. Um, this is a really powerful story, and we do well when we remember that this is what has shaped us, and um, we carry a lot of this with us.
But um, I hope that you've enjoyed these last couple of weeks learning about this particular period. We've got a lot more that's coming up, but um, thoughts, questions, comments? It's just so complicated and sticky. Way more. I know. I mean, I knew it was, but certainly I didn't know to that degree. Why are we moving? It's not good. That was amazing. <laughs> how, did, how did the common man become aware of people's souls in general and uh, you know I mentioned in my my Luther lecture that yeah like I mean this is a this is a scary thing because the actions of the nobles and the, the reactions um, you know are things like the Pope excommunicating whole countries what do you do if you are a loyal like you just want to you just want to serve God you just want you just want to go to heaven <laughs> and, and then these, and that's these not exactly, <laughs> but you know, then then these edicts come down that says your entire community is not going to be granted that because of the the things that your rulers have done. It's just really kind of a scary thing. But I do appreciate that by the end here. I mean, Elizabeth truly, like, I mean, she, everything's complicated. But she truly did want to create a world where Protestants and Catholics could coexist. That, that the line in the clip that I showed, the I have no desire to make windows into men's souls. I mean, she really like wanted to recognize that we don't all have to believe the same thing in order to be united both as a country and I think as a, as a church. So yeah, it's, it's scary stuff for the, the common people too. Real quick. Um... I feel like I, I don't know much about this period of history, but I always learned that like the Anglican Church kind of started because of the whole like Henry like and all his wives wanting to divorce and the Catholic Church didn't allow that, so he was like, I'm gonna start my own church. Yeah. But it seems way more complicated than that, like with what you present. Was there a particular point where they were like, we're the Church of England now and not? Yeah, I think that the I think that the language takes a little bit of time to be codified, but back when they were trying to get that annulment, I mean, part of that is that they could not go any further without breaking from Rome, declaring Henry to be the head, and what resulted is basically the Church of England. I'm not sure if they immediately used that language, but yeah. There's still more like Catholic Protestant language. Well, exactly, and, and like I said, like like after that break, nothing really changes. Yeah. So then, you know. When Elizabeth comes to the throne, there's kind of a re-establishment, and that is kind of what we could say is the true origin of the Church of England. Okay. Um, yeah, so if you want any recommendations on this period, kind of like I did with the Luther, feel free to ask. Um, also, if you want to indulge my neurodivergent um, hyperfixations, ask me how this whole story wraps up into my favorite Star Wars character that you've never heard about. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, but um, hopefully we'll see you next time.